You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this, the very last Mountain Gardener show of 2018. I think I've got some good insider tips on how to set the stage for your 2019 gardens. Uh, There are some insider tips you do in the winter. They're very easy to do, but they make a tremendous difference in a couple months. Usually, at most of the elevations in Arizona, we're going to see spring hit after Valentine's Day to the first part of March. You'll start to see those daffodils bloom. The crocus will be in bloom. The pansies will be going nuts. I mean, just glorious and then we'll get some snow, so that's the way it kind of works. It's it's not spring until really Mother's Day is what most of us use as the marker for the last frost. But many of your plants, they like frost. They need frost. They need cold nights and bright days. And so we're, you'll see, I was walking out in the yard, my own gardens, and the maples, the leaf buds are ginormous. The buds on the lilacs, I've got this beautiful white lilac. I love white because of the fragrance. Fragrance is a little more intense than the purples, I think. But we'll sell lilacs that repeat bloom, yellow lilacs, the traditional blues and purples and, and whites and everything in between. But to get them to bloom really well, to have that very large flower, to increase the fragrance, you really need to fertilize with superphosphate in the winter about now. So the month of January, if you could sprinkle some of that on and then really pray for snow. If you had superphosphate on the ground and then it snowed and that snow melts in a few days and seeps down and takes that phosphate down into the root structure, what you'll do is you'll double up on the number of buds that form this winter and each bud will be larger. So you have more intense bloom, thus more fragrance. Phosphorus doesn't focus on the foliage, the leaves. It focuses mainly on a more developed root structure and flower buds. So if you've got fruit trees, spring, anything spring blooming, forsythia, quince, uh, uh, lilacs, spireas, viburnums, any of those spring, those first spring bloomers, your flower beds, your, I would say, roses, if, you're, if you want to really get the flowers out of those, you put some superphosphate on there. Zero, 18, zero. So it's zero nitrogen, 18% phosphorus, and zero uh, potash, basically. That middle number in your, in your fertilizer recipe is mainly for roots and blooms. If you want bigger tomatoes, more apples, bigger lilacs, focus on the middle number. And we are lacking phosphorus in our mountain soils. So this is the time when you really want to focus on that, this midwinter. I would say also your evergreens, they're not going to like phosphorus so much, but they do appreciate some all-purpose plant food in midwinter. Seems counterintuitive, but the days are so short and it's just, uh, they start to yellow on us. We call it winter chlorosis. So uh, uh, yellowing, or they become pale. If you give them some of that 744 fertilizer in this midwinter, this New Year's time frame, what you'll find is they green up. They'll have bigger candle growth, those buds, those little buttons on the end of the uh, pine needles or spruce uh, tips, uh, the fir. Any of those evergreens are going to have, they're forming their spring growth now. They're much like a bulb, like a, a, like a tulip or a daffodil. That flower was formed last year, and then when it actually blooms, it elongates, it's using last year's energy, last year's food, last year's, what it developed in that flower uh, bulb, it uses that to form spring, for spring flowers. Then it fo- puts some foliage out, and that foliage gathers photosynthesis and then goes ahead and forms the following year's flower bulb or flowers. Well, your evergreens are very much the same way. They are forming next spring's uh, candle growth, that new elongated growth. Typically, your evergreens only grow once. They elongate in the spring and whatever you get, that's what's locked in. There is no more growth after that. So you want to maximize that flower, that that 
I call it a, a button or, or bud, that's needle bud. You see little buttons on the ends of those branches. You want to get those to be as plump as you can. And you want them to be as green as possible and have as many as you can. So if you've got a thin, real thin pine tree or spruce or fir or cypress or cedar, has it got damaged by gophers or grubs were in there or something happened, it just isn't quite as full as you want or it isn't as blue or as colorful as you want, you fertilize now in midwinter and it will increase those buds so that you'll have more buds and longer. Those That new candle growth in March and April will be longer and thicker and plumper and fuller. So the secret is doing a little bit of work. You just chuck it on the ground. You don't even work it in because we are going to have some weather events, some snow that will carry that down into the root structure. Those are some things that I'm doing right now. And then pruning. I'm pruning right now. So I'm, I'm strategically feeding or, or making certain plants very happy, mainly focused on my spring bloomers and my evergreens. And then I'm starting full on pruning. So I've taken the lawnmower. This is going to be a bit harsh for some of you gardeners. That's okay, but I'm into shortcuts. I'm not into finesse, and I find my gardens are just as pretty as yours they, they, with a whole lot less care. But I'm, but I'm a really busy guy. I'm, I'm all over the place. So I need to get in, get out, be done, and then enjoy the, the fruits of my labor out in the landscapes. What I'm doing is my perennial beds. These are flowers that come back every year. These flowers, they're, they're kind of dead right now. They look spent. They look like they've been burned back by frost and short days, and they're just resting. Some of these plants are such strong bloomers that if they bloomed like that continually, they would just run out of steam. So they need this rest period in the, in the winter months. I would say many of your leafy or deciduous trees, they need to take a break. So they can form next year's flower growth. That's the way it is for red buds and crab apples. Your flowering cherries, your purple leaf plums, all these spring bloomers, uh, they need to rest so that they can gather up their strength for the spring show. And so most of those nodules, if you look at your spring blooming trees, your spring blooming bulbs, all those bulbs, all those little nodules or leaf buds or flower buds, most of those on the spring bloomers, those are all flowers. Every one of those little bumps is going to be a flower for next spring. If you can get that plumper and bigger, the better off you are. For my perennials, I take the lawnmower. I've got an electric lawnmower. I've got a little tiny lawn. It's not even a grass lawn. It's a thyme lawn. So it's an herbal lawn. It looks good. It's green right now. I've hardly watered it, hardly care for it. But I'll take that lawnmower I use for that, you know, two, 300 square feet. It's very small. I'll use that lawnmower. I'll drag it to the backyard. I'll just run it over the gardens where I see my perennials growing. I want them as low. I'll set it on that highest blade, highest uh, adjustment. I'll just run that mower back and forth over it, and it just chews it up. And now I've got, I don't have rock in the backyard. I just have, I, I like to compost or mulch right on top of the ground. It helps the birds. It helps, it helps my gardens. It helps enrich my soil. So I naturally keep it. I like to compost on my native soil. It's just what I do. If you've got a rock lawn, this doesn't work as well for you, but you probably have your flowers congregated in groups or flower beds or islands of flowers. You can take your mower, weed whacker or just electric shears or just old fashioned shears, pruners, and just cut them back as close as you can to the ground. And that's all you got to do. I mean, that's it. You just do it now between now through February, the next couple months, Go ahead and do that pruning on those perennials. A couple caveats that I, this is just what I've learned personally over the years. Uh, I do not prune back my roses right now, and I don't prune back my salvia or uh, autumn sage, salvia gregii. These are these uh, hip high shrubs, have these beautiful red flowers that hummingbirds just love. I've found that if in certain winter events, they can get really damaged. And so I'll, I'll keep that structure up on those salvias and on my roses until I know the harshest of winters are over. And then I'll prune those back. I purposely wait to prune those back until usually March, into February, first part of March. And then I'll start pruning back those things because it's starting to get warm at that point. The soil temperature is getting higher. Yes, we still have frost, but it's not this bitter winter cold that we get. So I do, those are two things that I'm, I'm doing right now in my own gardens 
fertilizing, pruning, especially my perennials, getting ready for the spring bloom. Be right back with Lisa Waters Lane and your garden questions right after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. (laughs) Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Hi, Lisa with the plants of the week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Just what are other people talking about? And yeah, it's winter, it's the holidays. The uh, uh, questions are a little lighter right now, but are. Uh, people are indoors enjoying celebrations right. and eggnog and stuff. But what you'll find now is the seed catalogs will start showing up in your mailbox pretty quick. So they know who the gardeners are and they know how to mail and get them on email and that kind of stuff. Welcome yeah. to the studio. Well, thank you. Yeah. So how have your holidays been? Why don't you, you want to share a Busy. highlight at all? Oh, we have the grandkids up. And our daughter-in-law staying with us. So the house has been in quite the disarray, but it's fun. I even put the uh, Roby, the, the uh, automatic <laughs> vacuum away going, there's just too much stuff on the floors. It'll, it'll be, just get clogged it'll instantly. Be sucking up everything. Yeah, you can't have parts everywhere, like yeah. baby stuff everywhere, and kids' mm-hmm. toys. And it's better for, I put it down the workout rooms. So, no, mm-hmm. that's good enough. Just work down there. <laughs> even then, I think the kids go down and yeah. leave stuff around that's so. just kids you forget kids. Yeah. you know when you're in the midst of it you don't think about it because you're always dealing with it but when you got kids visiting it's like oh my <laughs> and i noticed the trash cans oh. are overflowing the trash <laughs> hasn't come for two more days what are we gonna do <laughs> talk to neighbors you mind if we use some of your extra capacity the problem is those that are traveling out of town, their cans aren't, aren't, aren't out. out. Yeah. And those that are, they've got guests too. Right, right. So we usually bring it in and throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> well, yeah, we've brought a couple loads into the nursery just to take the edge off. So garden questions. Okay. What do we got there? Well, we, you're right. We do have some more indoor type plant questions okay. that are different for this time of year. Uh, so Linda... Traveling, because a lot of us travel this time, you're going to be leaving town for two weeks, which means the house is going to be a lot chillier. Yeah. So her question is, are the house plants going to be okay with a colder house? You should. Now, the tr- house plants are tropical plants, and that's the reason they're growing under that canopy layer of very tall trees. And so we're harvesting the smaller plants that grow underneath that, so are used to shadows, darker rooms, uh, tropical climates. And they like consistency. So if you know that about plants, they can grow in a pot that's very tight because they're used to competing competing roots in the jungles. Uh, and they're used to warmer tropical climates that are protected. Yeah, they'll go down to mid-50s. Six, they want to be in the 60s, 70s, most tropical plants. You might bump that uh, temperature up a couple degrees just while you're away. Mm-hmm. It won't really increase your bill that much. I mean, don't go down to 52, 55. Your plants won't be happy. Mm-hmm. Not in January, if you're in this midwinter yeah. time frame. So keep it up mm-hmm. just a touch and it should be fine. Yeah. 
Another one to watch is some plants really prefer a little bit brighter room. Mm -hmm. And so you might look to see which rooms, you know, during the growing season, it was fine in that back living room with big windows, but in the center part of the room, you might want to move it a little closer to the lighted, to the light coming in. Mm -hmm. It'll, they'll respond well to that. And so watch, watch that. Talk to your plants. They're talking to you and then water them real good before you leave. Mm -hmm. They should be good to go in a cooler house. For a couple of weeks, they should be fine. Yeah. You might, what would you think about grouping them together? Well, it's, that'll help them keep them from drying out. Mm -hmm. And plants do help. It's kind of like puppy dogs in a, in a nest. They like curl up and help each other stay warm. Plants do the same thing. So they help yeah. each other regulate temperature, moisture, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think that's always a good idea. Right. And you might find some of your more sensitive plants, your ficus and those types of plants, when you come back, may have some yellow leaves shed. Yeah. Uh, but I find most of the time, once they kind of get back to that normal routine in place, they're yeah. fine. They're kind of like grandkids. <laughs> they like consistency. Same all, the same temperature, same routine, same light, same. If you go off, they start to go, I'm not happy, and they shed some leaves. Yeah. There's just this natural cycle to house plants mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. So it should be good. Okay. Well, our other question from Jan is somewhat related. She wants to know, do you really need grow lamps to grow most of your house plants inside? Absolutely not. And again, like we had mentioned before, we're selecting varieties that are used to growing under the canopy of in the jungles of wherever in the in the on the planet we're finding unique varieties that, that are used to growing in the shade areas that are used to competing with multiple big plants competing for small amounts of soil a little bit of soil makes a big difference for some of these plants that's the kind of plants we're using for house plants mm -hmm. so i don't think you need grow lamps unless you're growing in a dark basement You've got the inside cubicle in your office where it's just, it's darker in there. You don't have windows close by. Uh, I think then you might consider grow lights possibly, or you're starting your seedlings. Let's say you're starting your lettuce crop or your beets or your, your greeny materials that are going to go in the gardens the end of February and March. You're starting those now. They would appreciate mm -hmm. a grow lights. We at the garden center here, we changed all of our inside lights out uh, to a daylight bright light. So we've got fluorescent LED lights or spotlights. All of them are daylight sensitive. It's a broader spectrum of light. And the plants thrive. And the inside of the store is quite dark because we've got patios and greenhouses surrounding that. The house plant room actually has full-on greenhouse glass. It's a lot more light. The other greenhouse room or, or, or house plant room has got fancy uh, skylights that mm -hmm. let more light in. Then we've got changed out the light bulbs, and they just thrive in that. So I don't think you need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your plants will tell you, though. That's true. They'll start stretching, getting thin. They'll shed leaves. You know, oh, Maybe show some yellowing. They're not and, quite, yeah. yeah, they're not happy. Mm -hmm. So change out a few light bulbs. Mm -hmm. Should be good. Or put it closer to the win window, window. winter time. Yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah. The daylight is so short right now. So we're at our shortest time for the next couple of weeks. This are, these are our shortest days of the year. So plants can struggle for light. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically we're indoors more. So the lights are on more. True. So if you've got the right light bulbs, mm -hmm. it can usually compensate for that. Okay. Good All right. question. Next question is from David. He was given some heirloom seeds for vegetables, and he wants to know the best way to store them. Oh, sure. So you harvested those last fall, and they've, they've just keep them cool. So at the farm, we always just kept a refrigerator huh? at, at, out underneath the shed. Mm -hmm. We didn't even plug it in. <laughs> we just used it as a huge insulated box that uh -huh. kept the sun. We kept it out of the sun, and it would keep that temperature down the 50s or so. It's pretty good. Uh, you could put it actually in the refrigerator. Don't let them freeze, but I would say put them in the refrigerator, and that will store them long enough. I would say in an unheated garage, mm -hmm. in some jars or bags or something that breathes would probably okay. be better, uh -huh. just in case there's some moisture left in that, because you're, you're getting these from other folks, it sounded like. You just don't know. I don't know. I just don't have enough info here. So let it breathe. You're okay. So paper and bags. Paper bags. Good. Yep. Burlap okay. bags. Mm -hmm. The 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 new jewelry bag that you got <laughs> uh, your wife for that new fancy. 
take that bag and use it for store seed. Anything that's breathable would be just fine. Okay. And it's fine out in the garage, but not in the house, probably. You don't want it to be warm. house is a little bit warmer, so you, and it's dry, so it can dry out maybe too fast. So you'll lose some. Some of the seed will be viable, but, but you want them all to be viable. You don't right. want to lose any or spoil any. Mm -hmm. So usually a garage is a better way to go that's not in direct sunlight, that the temperature is cooler on the cooler side. Okay. Well, that's good advice. And when you're starting them, little, I mean, egg crates, little cups, pea pots, pea, pots, pea pellets, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They do make a good soil, a seedling mix potting soil. It's a fancy soil. It breathes a little bit better that encourages more roots or deeper roots, mm -hmm. faster roots on plants. Probably come in and get a bag of that. That's worthwhile. It'll it'll increase your, your seed germination rate mm -hmm. and the, the how thick the roots grow on that new seedling. Mm -hmm. I'd probably start that. And you're probably going to start most of your heirloom stuff because they're usually summer vegetables. You'll start those typically in March. So what's the def definition of an heirloom seed? Why is it heirloom? As opposed to just so you've got seed. hybrid. Hybrid is we're either grafting or we've we've pollinated one with the other to make this fancy new variety that's more disease resistant. An heirloom is it produced fruit by itself, it produced the seed by itself, and you 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 can't regulate the genetics as easily. Uh, but your brandy wines, uh, those are an heirloom variety. So there's different varieties like that. That's what it is. So you can mm -hmm. take a seed off an heirloom and reseed it and get the same kind of variety of, of tomato or cucumber or whatever. So that's an heirloom. None of our plants or, or se our seed are genetically modified GMO'd here at Waters Garden Center on purpose. Be right back with more on the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. Listening to the Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. Now, I, I gave the crew off between Christmas and New Year's, so just the, the Waters Garden Center were closed between Christmas and New Year's. I've done this a couple of years where. The crew really enjoys it. They're all, all over the planet. I mean, from Hawaii to Midwest to wherever. And what, what I find for myself, though, is I don't have the pressure of, I've got to open the store. I have to be there. Oh, trucks are coming in. I met a couple like houseplants. We had a full-on, I mean, a big order of houseplants come in. And I had to meet the truck here. And I had my houseplant buyer kind of help out. It was kind of fun working just solo without the pressure of phones and Customers coming in. It was just kind of relaxing. But what I find is I forget what day it is or what time it is, or you just don't have that sequence of <laughs> getting up and going to work because we're all doing vacation stuff. So we just relax. Had grandkids at the house. It's just kind of nice to have that break for just a moment. And so they look forward to that. And, and so do I. One thing to watch, I mentioned houseplants. In the house, I am noticing we've, we've had a lot of calls, a lot of emails, a lot of conversation about little tiny gnats showing up in the house. When you're looking at your iPad, that glow, uh, they're attracted to the light. You'll find little tiny gnats attracted to the windows when it's warmer. 
Uh, you'll see them at the computer screen, the TV screen. They're, they're attracted to light. They're fungus gnats. They're a natural phenomenon, a natural thing, natural bug in the midwinter, and they can do damage to many of your houseplants. That fungus gnat, the little tiny fly basically, uh, its larva stage is a maggot, a little white worm that gets in the soil. So they live out most of their life in the soil of your houseplants. They're a tropical kind of bug. They need the warmth. They don't like outdoors. They naturally came looking for any nook or cranny that gets into your house. Or you bought a plant from a box or typically it's from a grower that didn't have a clean greenhouse and they got some fungus gnats in the greenhouse and then they went and retailed them and, and you brought it home with you from that poinsettia or Christmas cactus or whatever and then put it in your house. There's, there's several ways. It's easy to spread. And so this fungus gnat just gathers. They're very social. They like to grow in colonies, basically. They're in groups. So they'll be in one house plant, typically in a room, but they infect the entire room. When that plant gets infested enough, they'll come out and spread to the next plant. They just kind of slowly kind of devour all the house plants in your room. But you'll notice they're kind of congregated in certain rooms. So they won't be in the bedroom. They'll be in the living room or the dining room or the Arizona room. This is serious, though. I know they're tiny, and you can kind of wave them off your face while they're trying to bother you while checking your emails. But they're, they're dangerous to your plants. They eat the roots off of plants. That's their main diet. They live in the soil. They need to be moist, warm, and a good, healthy plant so that they can eat the roots off of it. So if a plant seems to be needing more water, it gets kind of wilty, and you've got little gnats in the house, almost guaranteed it's the fungus gnats living in that house. Okay, what, what do you do? If you've got little tiny gnats in your houseplants, I don't care if it's an herb or, or whatever it is, typically Dracaenas and Pothos and these other house, green houseplants you've got, especially your holiday plants, if you see that, try to figure out where they're coming from. A real easy way to do that is they make a yellow sticky trap or white fly trap. They're attracted to light, remember. So what they do is they put a sticky paste on top of bright yellow paper and they put it on a basically a popsicle stick and you stick it in the back of the plant. And when they come up, so they, they come up into their adult stage where they start flying. So they go from larva stage, worm, to flying. And they're going, oh, where do I go now? Oh, look at the pretty light. And they go stuck right on top of the, the paper. And you can quickly prevent them from laying more eggs, which is they only live for three, four days, no more than a week. Once they start to become an adult, they only fly around for a few days and they die. If you can get them to get stuck on top of this yellow paper, you can prevent them from spreading the mayhem throughout the house. Also, it helps you identify which plants they're actually attracted to or growing in or, or drawn to. So that helps you isolate it and keep things from preventing. Very inexpensive. You get a package for like, I don't know, three of them for under 10 bucks. I don't know all the details, but they're very inexpensive for what you get for them. Now, when you know where they're at, now you can actually go after them. What we really recommend is systemic insecticide. So it's a granular. You sprinkle it on top of the soil, water it in, goes to the soil, and kills off all the larvae, all the maggots that are living in the soil. And it's a permanent fix. It's once and done. It's, it's a little stinky, but it's hugely effective. This would be great for everything but your herbs. I wouldn't use it on edible plants. Or if you've got puppy dogs or, or cats that really love to eat the dirt, that kind of stuff. Because it's not an organic solution. It's a chemical solution. But it's so effective because they're living in this soil, it's hard to get rid of them. If you want to go organic, I would use diatomaceous earth. It's kind of messy powdery, especially inside the door, inside the uh, house. But if you sprinkle this kind of powdery paste on top of the ground, and as, the, as anything passes through it, it, cr- it cuts their body open, and then they dry out, basically. So you can keep the adults from coming up to the soil, and then as the maggots kind of crawl around and come up to the soil, they get the diatomaceous earth on them, and it keeps them at bay. Now that's your solution for fungus gnats and what to look for. Uh, probably through the next couple of months, you'll you'll find they really get bad until spring hits. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. 
Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. And we're back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your... Well, with her, not I was thinking segment two garden question, which you've already done. <laughs> I was thinking your your segment of, of just garden tips, right. what you're thinking, what's on your mm-hmm. thought uh, out in the garden. So welcome back in the studio. Well, thank you. So we're entering the new year. Do you have any resolutions for the new year? Sure. Lose five pounds like everyone else. <laughs> oh, travel more. Well, that means you have to not eat one day and you lose five pounds. <laughs> I don't know. I put on a little bit more weight this this winter. I don't know the uh-huh. piles of food. I think there was the same amount of food, but not as many people, people to come and eat it. it. So there's more left over, which means you can graze longer. <laughs> <laughs> I know we had a ton at the garden center. Oh yeah, we have um, our guy Monrovia guy. He and his wife bring in fudge every Homemade. year. Homemade. Oh, oh my gosh, beautiful. And they bring in like pounds of it. Yeah. It's so good. And that's just the start. It gets worse from there. So I noticed yeah. that companies are feeling better too. So more companies are allowing their sales reps to bring to to go <laughs> go give more stuff. So the pile of junk food Got, is, yeah. is, is more than usual. During the downturn, it was like <laughs> Jim and his wife would bake fudge, and that was it. That's all you'd see. You wouldn't even see a, a, a Christmas card. I mean, nothing. They cut off all expense mm-hmm. trying to survive, and now right. everyone gives a Chris. The walls full of Christmas cards, and yeah, it's kind of nice. Full of, it's it is nice, nice to see the wall full it is. again, and yeah, I'm thinking about you. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Just lose five pounds. Well, uh, travel more with my pretty wife, and <laughs> see exotic places, and visit the grandkids. That's good. Yeah. Well, I have some. New Year's garden resolutions this year. Okay, that seems interesting. That's a good idea. Sure. Yeah. So my first one is, and this I'm going to have to work on because you know me, I'm not very technically or digitally inclined. But I saw a hint about putting doing a digital garden scrapbook. Oh, and that's I interesting. Thought, Taking oh, pictures that's a really and storing. Idea. Yeah. yeah, sure. You know, because so many times we just we forget what we did last year or how the yard used to look and. I think it's good to have that file for yourself to look back on. And who wants to keep all those papers and pictures around anymore when you can do it digitally now? Now that they have an app, have you got that fancy new iPhone or cell phone or smartphone for, for the holidays? <laughs> I'll bet you can look at the PlayStation, Play Store, the store. I'll be. bet they have a garden app for that. If not, we should make that. We, we, could, be a, we could be rich finally. We could be billionaires. Just on a... Scrapbook for gardeners <laughs> on a global scale. I just think it's such a good idea yes, to digitally yeah. have it because there's so many things you think you're going to remember and you just space it. Yeah. But anyways, that was a good Maybe one. Maybe that's an age thing, not, a, not an organization well, thing. Could be. <laughs> just kidding. That's another show. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, the second one is to work on neglected spots in my yard. Sure. Now, we have a, our front yard is spectacular because we spend a lot of time out there and we really enjoy it. And we know people see it from the street. So we there's not much neglected in our front yard. But our backyard, there's a few spaces there that are mm, pretty it's bad. It's more native, though. It's more like Oasis. So the pots are pretty good. And then you go float out into the... There's in fact, I'm transitioning <laughs> to more native stuff. Well, natives are good. But I'm talking spots. There are some spots where, that could you know, use the shovels that are broken and get stored. Oh and, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. You know, that rake that you should have thrown away ten years ago is out there. The wheelbarrows behind this juniper tree, <laughs> hoping you don't see it. <laughs> so just kind of hitting some of those more neglected spots. But along with that concept is being out in your garden more. 
So my goal is to at least once a week, even when it's cold, go walk out in my yard, in my garden, and just either enjoy it, bring my hot tea out there, my cocoa, anything like that, and just enjoy being out in my yard. So is that the backyard and the front yard? Yeah. Or just Yeah, okay, good. I'll go with you. Oh, you I will. like walking the garden. <laughs> it's funny, last night I took the dogs out into the backyard and walked with them, and I... I'll confess, I don't go into the backyard that often. You do a lot. Um, but I was out there walking with the dogs, walking with Bailey and stuff. And they were like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that's a place where dad plays ball with us and comes out. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. what made me realize there's a lot of maybe neglected spots yeah. you need to take a look at. I want to read you the pond. So yeah, I need to do that because Vincent climbs in during the summer and the rock walls are kind of falling. I need right. to cement those, secure those in. Yeah, definitely. My other one, my third one, is encourage new gardeners. There okay. are a lot of people that are new to gardening. Either they've retired, um, they've got more space now, they've got grandkids. The, the concept of a community garden is much more yeah. popular now. So to encourage those people to garden, because it can be a little discouraging here, especially if you've moved from other parts where you know there there actually is soil and They don't get the cold temperatures and all that. So it can be a little discouraging here your first year. Some parts of the uh, uh, country, I could throw this microphone into the ground and start to grow (laughs) another microphone. It's crazy. Here, you got to be more deliberate. So in a dry climate, Mm -hmm. it's extremes because we're higher elevation. It's four season. Maybe they came from tropicals. I think that, you know what you should do? What? You should should have your own radio show. (laughs) Podcast. (laughs) It just start now. Never mind. Oh, okay. I think a lot of schools now, a lot of preschools and elementary schools are doing more gardening programs. So I thought, you know, just yeah. encourage Good them idea. in that. Um, divide my overgrown perennials, oh, which again is our backyard. <laughs> yeah. That's, I've been postponing that I for know. a couple of years. But it's, <laughs> we have parts of our perennials that are just mm. out of control. Yeah. So we really it's need time. to take some time and divide those out and move them throughout different parts of the yard. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so definitely need to do that. My other one, and I love this one, is talk more with other gardeners. Now, I, I, we talk to a lot of people day in and day out. But I love talking to passionate gardeners. You'll learn so much. Yes. You get jazz. You get energized. We yeah. do. We went to an event. Um, at, where were we? Prescott Lakes. Prescott, yeah. And the gal sitting next to us, Elizabeth, she's a passionate gardener. And she was talking about her heirloom seeds and how many generations she's had these seeds. And you know, I confess, it went way over my head. But <laughs> I enjoyed talking with her because she had... A, different way of thinking about it, different views. And I, I love talking with people that can teach you something yeah. or encourage you to learn something new. So it's a great one. Yeah. Get out there and more talk to other people. I want to plant, you talked about this more natives. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I think natives sometimes get a bad rap, you know, they're like, Oh, they're just ugly. Well, I'll confess sometimes in a pot, they are ugly, yeah. but you got to give them in your soil and get them in their environment. And there are some gorgeous natives out there. And you're right. We wanted to do more of our backyard, more native things. So it's easier care. So that's one thing I really want to learn this year is more natives, where they go, uh, best practices to grow Try them. To introduce more natives, mm-hmm. find more natives, bring them in. There's, there's a lot of that, that palette keeps expanding every year. And there are some really pretty low care drought hardy western natives that, that thrive right in the mountains of arizona yeah, yeah. and then there's a lot that maybe aren't, aren't true natives but they sure act like natives oh yeah and the growers are really coming out with a lot more interesting plants that are drought hardy heat resistant uh, pollinators those kinds of things and my last one goes along with this is to plant more milkweed for the monarchs and other butterflies oh good idea sure. and the reason i got excited about this is because patty who works for us that's right i think she said she had 90 uh crystallis that she washed over she's like the mother monarch she is she is she should be a mon- i think she was a butterfly in a previous life or but something she had over she's really put in a lot of um milkweed into her yard and she had over 90 wow. chrysalis and butterflies come out she'd bring them into the nursery yeah she we gave her a little cage she'd br- bring the chrysalis there and they would hatch and come out and they would get going they'd expand then she'd go out and she'd tag it and then yeah. go release it in the greenhouses and then she can track where they show up uh-huh. 
throughout the state or wherever they wherever they show she up in the country. She had one, I think maybe two weeks ago, and her husband took drove it down to Phoenix. Oh, you're kidding me. So it would be warm. <laughs> so she cares. I just think that's so cool that she does that. Great New Year's resolutions for gardeners. That's mm-hmm. super. So Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. We are closed until... Uh, January 2nd, so 2019. we got to switch oh. that year over. So, uh, But we'll be back at it Tuesday. I think, I think that's a Tuesday, isn't uh, it? Wednesday. Wednesday the 2nd. We've got a lot more in store for you. Don't change that dial. We'll be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Now, we have had the uh, planting crews out, so I've been talking to them. They're planting a lot of a lot of spruce, pine, a lot of evergreen trees, and uh, they're telling me that the ground is really hard in certain neighborhoods. That I'd go over what to really look for, especially in those subdivisions that have really hard soil. So we don't even think about going to, let's say, Eagle, not Eagle Ridge, uh, Viewpoint, Granville, uh, Prescott Lakes. Oh my gosh, you poor folks. Uh, Chino Valley, in the older parts of, of the uh, um, Chino Valley area, very nice soil, but it's been used for farming. And that new subdivision up on the hilltops, terrible oh my gosh i don't know how you guys garden out there and it's just heavy clay soils with rocks in it and so when you're going out there and you hit a a hard spot uh, you need to have a digging bar or a jackhammer or something to really help you get through that hard pan that layer of caliche or what will happen is next spring when you start to power up those that irrigation cycle It'll load up. It'll basically you dug a bathtub. It'll it'll run. It'll go to that hard pan, and then the water will stop. Then it'll cycle through again, and it'll, that water will build up and surround that root ball to where eventually, by midsummer, the plant collapses and dies. And it's nothing that you've done. It just wasn't planted right, so this this soil didn't perk, didn't drain right. And so when we're seeing that, so I was talking to the guys. So Jared's our go-to foreman. Uh, very knowledgeable with soils in the surrounding community. He's the guy that leads the teams that goes out and plants for folks. Uh, I just got him a brand new 70 pound jackhammer. We've got 35s on the truck. We need to upsize because some of these, some of the soils are just terrible and it's not the frost. It's not the cold. The ground isn't frozen in the gardens. We don't need to pick through all that. It's when we start digging to, to make the right planting hole, we run into these hard pan layers, this caliche layer or this rock layer, and then that's what's going to affect the plant's growth come next year. We know that, so we're trying to modify that. So when we do that, we're taking a very sharp point in the jackhammer, and just we just try to fracture that. We may not need to dig the hole deeper. We just need to fracture that soil so that it breaks it up so that the water can penetrate through to the next soil band. So once the water reaches the next soil band, it usually starts to flow and, and, and the plants are happy again. It's when you reach a, a, a layer of soil that's very impenetrable to, to water. Just the, the molecules are so tight that water can't get through them. The particles are just so tight. They just create this, this bond that can't get through. It's like cement. 
You need to break that up. You can do it with a digging bar. And, and that's what I do at my house when I'm digging my, myself because I don't want a you know, thousand, fifteen hundred dollar jackhammer. You can go rent them from the rental yards. Uh, on the truck, since we've got crews that land, there it's about efficiency. So we, uh, we make sure they've got all the tools they need on the truck, the lift gates, the big dollies, so they can get the job done efficiently. I don't want them stuck in the yard for, for days digging out, you know, digging, planting these plants. We need efficient. We need fast. And so they can get to the next project. So we give them the tools they need. But there we'll take the big jackhammer, try to fracture that up with a tight point and just break everything up. Now that works for soil. That is, there's a hard soil pan. If you've actually got a rock shelf that is up Copper Basin um, here in Prescott, they've got heavy rocks, just hard, just rocks. I mean, boulders. We're talking granite boulders uh, towards Granite Mountain here in the Central Highlands uh, of Arizona. There's this huge mountain that's just called Granite Mountain. Uh, that one, you'll get boulders as you get close to that mountain. And once you hit a boulder, you can't plant there, not, not especially in evergreen. You can shift a little bit and get away from it, get into the soil. That happens often. Or we'll raise the bed up. We'll take some boulders or some retaining block. We'll actually create a mini raised bed in between these rocks to get enough soil for that plant to go. But we can't take a jackhammer and start breaking up this huge boulder. They're just too hard. And the, you'll never break it up enough where the water starts to penetrate. Sometimes the water will creep down in between the boulders, but we can't see that on top when we're when we're planting for you. So just be aware when you're when you're planting a new tree, a shrub, or whatever you're doing in 2019, this coming year, put it on your radar that a plant that if you hit a rock shelf or a heavy clay soil. You'll need to do a little extra work to get it where that plant, where the water will penetrate down to the next soil band. That's really Granville, that whole viewpoint, that whole backside of Prescott Valley. That's heavy clay all the way up to Pronghorn and Quailwood, all those areas. And that, that soil is the same all the way up the valley. And then from there, you go to Chino Valley, then Paulden, and you wrap around to Skull Valley, it changes. But that whole valley region, that's what you really need to watch for. In fact, a little trick, Lisa and I, our first house here in Arizona was in Prescott Valley. This is back when they had dirt roads, septic fields, all kinds of stuff. Every house had their own little compound that they, they gardened in. Um, there, heavy clay. Uh, I had the backside, I think unit 18, or I forget where it was, off of Pawnee. Uh, there, we gardened, and I was struggling killing plants. I started to keep my evergreens raised up a touch so i would leave about two to three inches of the roots out of the ground then i would mound the soil up so every plant was on a very slight mound from a distance you couldn't tell only i could tell then i'd put the drip emitter on top of that but what that did for me was in that heavy heavy clay soil it ensured that no matter what monsoonal rains or march snow wet patterns hit us those are typically our wettest months where damage is done it, no matter how wet it got, I ensured that at least two, three inches of the roots could breathe. So plants do not like to be surrounded and sitting in water, unless it's a cattail or some, you know, willows or something. They're okay with that. But not most of your native drought hardy. The most of the plants that we're planting, they like to breathe in between water cycles. So if you're digging a hole and it's heavy clay, then in summer, you start watering you know, twice a week, and this, this hole just fills up slowly over a month or two time, and all of a sudden, the plant is surrounded by water, and then it collapses mid to late summer. You're wondering, well, what happened? It just up and died. No, it's been dying. It's been drowning for two months. It just gave up late summer. That's all indications of why that happens. The other one to watch, too, while I'm thinking about this, we had, we we're seeing a number of folks. This is more of the central rocky areas where we dig a hole and then we didn't give the soil enough soil. We didn't give the plant enough room. So you'll get this big um, Arizona cypress or big juniper, a big fruit tree. Or you dig this hole and it thrives for three, four years. Then all of a sudden it collapses. When we dig those out, look at that. So we'll come out and we'll replant or get, get going for you. We look at that. It literally just 
ran out of room. It bumped up against the edges of the rock piles or where you dig, where you had dug the, the hole. All of a sudden it goes, no more soil. I'm a big tree. I need more moisture, more food, more space than this. And then they collapse on folks. This is especially important if you're, let's say you had a house and it, it was previously owned. So they didn't quite dig the holes big enough or wide enough, or they didn't get through that next layer. And all of a sudden you're going, why, why did this tree die? I'm a gardener. I'm from the Midwest. I know how to do this. Why did it collapse? Sometimes it's not you. It's just, it wasn't put in correctly on the front side. And so it runs out of space as you get down the line. So make sure there's enough space for that plant to transition. There's enough surrounding soil to go from the hole you, you had dug into that surrounding native earth. If you do that, it's got years, decades, and decades of growth and happiness to come. Uh, long, You'll be long gone before that plant finally develops and, and matures, keeps going, because you gave it enough space to grow in. So watch the, the rock, rock shelves, the heavy soil bands, and then make sure you, you give that plant enough space to grow for the future as well. That's a secret to really great hedgerow, fruit trees, great rose bed, lilacs that just thrive. That's the inside secret on how to really plant it right. Make sure you dig the hole up front and then you'll have years of, of happiness to follow. Be right back with more garden tips, tricks, and advice. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Roman Beauty Roseberry. This Mediterranean beauty has graceful, arching branches that flow over rock walls, raised beds, or container's edge. A culinary herb often used in potpourri. Rugged, deer-resistive, evergreen, likes crummy soil, drought, and abuse. Now that's my kind of shrub for under $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love unusual, healthy herbs, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Birds, we, we had tremendous bird activity. I mean, robins are, are everywhere. Dove are happy in our backyard, mainly because we have water. It seems like they're desperate for water. You might consider putting a pan, a saucer, a bird bath, or something out there so that your birds have, they are just be happy with you. I'm not giving them a food source at all. My yard just naturally has that for them. So they're pecking around, looking for things. But they're not, I'm not, I'm not feeding actual, give them seed or suet, any of those. I just give them water. And a lot of it, I've got it in the front yard, the backyard, and I've got it where those pumps don't freeze, the water doesn't. I've got a, a fountain in the front yard where it's, the water basin is actually underground. I've got it buried in rocks, and it's got this beautiful granite face that comes up, and water runs only during the day, so I don't have this freezing action. So I don't want to damage this beautiful granite polished piece, a decorative art piece. So I've got water underground and then it runs during the day and the, the birds love it. They take baths in there. They drink with it. I did notice the, the water got a little sour. And so I chlorinated it just a touch to clean it up because I don't want, I don't want to disease my birds. So I'm doing that watching my plants, uh, for the health of my, my plants, my actual plants, I'm fertilizing with 744 all-purpose food, the evergreens, and I'm making sure superphosphate goes on to 
my blooming plants of spring. So lilacs, forsythia, quince. I've got a lot of spring bloomers. I just love that spring flush of growth, the celebration that happens going, we are so happy winter's over. Let's bloom. I love that. And so I, I make sure those plants are very, very happy. After the food's on, I make sure I've been watering. I mean, a deep soak. I've been running this last week, my landscape. So especially the flowers, the pansies are super happy. The snapdragons, even close to the house, they're blooming. Well, the kale are glorious. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so I'm making sure I water those. But also, don't forget your trees. They haven't seen moisture, a deep soak, for quite a while. Yet it's getting colder. So if you just water those once a month, twice a month, it really keeps them healthier and happier. And it will help get some of that food down the ground. I don't work my food in the ground. I just kind of chuck it on and walk away and expect irrigation and really snow to do its work. Uh, so th watch those things. And then lastly, we have published our garden classes for spring. And so we're putting those on our Facebook page and on our website. So watersgardencenter.com and then you know facebook.com forward slash, guess what it is? Waters Garden Center. It just pops right up. And then look under the events tab. And you'll see all the classes listed there for spring. So we start out with houseplants. So the very first class is on houseplants. And that's mainly the reason we got such a large order of houseplants this week. Uh, we just stocked the store completely full so that we're getting ready for this class. And these are big trees. Some of them are full-on trees, trunks on them. But they're, they're tropical, so they're used to tight spaces and being in small pots and being in the house and taking up a corner and freshening up. Giving When that Christmas tree goes away, your, your house is going to feel a bit empty. You're going to miss that. So we know that, so we load up with some houseplants. But it's healthy, happy houseplants on January 19th. January 26th, we've made some of our own special wildflower blends. So it's the time, January, February, that's your time to put wildflower seed out in the yard so you'll have it for next spring. We'll show you how to do that, which mixes are best, then how to prune, February 2, gardening for newcomers, February 9, and it keeps going on on how to deal with gophers, succulents, and cactus. We've got all of that. Take a look. We want you to be a better gardener this year, and so we provide these classes free every Saturday at 930 Please come be our guests and just hang out with other cool people that like funky gloves and great hats and spending time in the sun out in the gardens. Those are gardeners. We like hanging out with each other and learning from each other. And that's what the classes are for. Until next week, I wishing you a happy, prosperous new year to you and your gardens. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, oh, man! Another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.